so I'll get everyone to kind of come to um, So I am going to go with some questions first that are more based on the anatomy and things that our, our chiefs gave us videos of a couple years ago uh, to learn from. So this is just uh, for anyone to... Which layer of the iris is absent at an iris crypt? Yeah, so that's the crypt's form on the anterior border of the layer um, is not there and allows the indentation to form. This is me, but I thought the dilator was the cranial nerve five, and then the sphincter muscle is cranial nerve three. Unless I mix them up, which could be possible. <laughs> um, and then the nerves that innervate the sphincter muscle, kind of as talked about, synapse at ciliary ganglion, adding nerve westphal nucleus, ciliospinal center of budge, or the superior cervical ganglion. <coughs> Just killing it. That's the ciliary ganglion. It does go through the hiding of westphal nucleus, but does not synapse there. And the other two are sympathetic pathways. Which two drugs uh, diagnose the Horner syndrome, and which one helps localize the lesion? the short ciliary nerves, not the long ones. Um, and the last one, which pharmacologic agent uh, best used to diagnose Horner syndrome in the acute phase? So we're going to go over a few cases um, as illustrative points in terms of just things to know in a neuroophthalmology clinic and on call and in general. Um, so this first case here is uh, someone who I saw in clinic fairly recently. She's a 68-year-old woman. Um, she has a history of breast cancer. She had a mastectomy for that. Um, she had been seen by UKI's clinic because she had a, um, an episode of nodular scleritis in the right eye. And she had a laboratory workup for that, and nothing had come back, and she'd been treated and had, it had gotten a lot better. Um, she had a history of convergence insufficiency. And so she was referred because she's had um, this uh, anisocoria that's been pretty persistent, but has recently, after her more recent clinic visits, become a little bit more pronounced. Um, so when she's telling me about her history, she says that um, I was a grad student in Paris, and I couldn't read really well, and they diagnosed me with convergence insufficiency, and they gave me some exercises to work on, 
and it got better, and I've only seen an orthoptist once since then, and I haven't had to do anything else for it, um, but that took a few months to resolve. Um, and then in the past month or so, she's had uh, double vision. She says she like gets her phone out in the middle of the night to read it, and when she's trying to read it, um, she it takes her like five to ten minutes to be able to focus on her phone. It's like really hard for her to focus on that. Um, she also says that she had a neck injury during judo practice when she was age, age 18, and she's had like multiple um, chiropractory sessions since then because she's had chronic neck pain because of that. So on exam, um, she has 20-20 vision in both eyes, which is corrected. Um, her pupils are two millimeters, and we couldn't get them to uh, be different in uh, light or dark, so they're around the same in dark and light. Um, and she has about minus one restriction on up gaze um, in her right eye, nothing on the left eye. And then she's got a, um, like a four diopter exotropia that is slightly more pronounced on left gaze and less pronounced on down gaze. And on convergence testing, or uh, when d looking at her conversion, she, her near point of diplopia was about eight centimeters. So she's pretty good. Um, so exotropia or exotropia? Uh, exophoria. She was able to use that for the most part. But she was having the double visions. This was likely the cause of that. And so on examination, she had, I wish I had a picture, because we didn't take people th pictures of her. Um, so. To my best description, she had a mild, uh, she had dramatic glaze on the left side, but she had a little bit of uh, ptosis on the right side. It was about a millimeter different than the left. And it was, her, um, her sulcus was uh, up a little bit as well. And the iris had some anisocoria. You can see below there that her levator function was um, normal on both sides. She had strong orbicularis. And the fundus exam was, uh, she had some elevated cup disc ratio. Um, so the, th uh, the thought about this case, so in a patient who has anisocoria uh, right greater than left, um, she has maybe a little bit of ptosis on that side, um, hard to really tell, and she's had this uh, exophoria that's you know, a little bit uh, better on down gaze and worse on left gaze. So it wasn't, a, it wasn't like a slam dunk case for this is a cranial third nerve palsy because they were all very subtle findings. But she had all three signs of it. And so, of course, in that case, you have to go for the imaging just to be sure that that's not the case. Um, before you go up, can you yes. go back one slide? Because you've measured the exo, and you're saying she's got an elevation deficit of the right eye, but you didn't measure a vertical deviation? I didn't remember. I didn't, I didn't see it documented, so I don't think we did document a vertical deviation. Yes. You don't know for sure that she's got an elevation deficit unless there's actually a deviation. Because if she's got ptosis there, mm -hmm. then it can be really like subtle um, limitations can be hard because even though you know that's not what you're supposed to do, you can use the lid to judge right. the eyeball movement. That's probably true. So you're right, we should have looked at that. So the way you confirm if there really is an elevation deficit is by looking for a a vertical deviation in upgaze. Yeah, exactly. Right. Did you do that? She didn't say that she had any difficulty moving her eyes around. Um, okay. So the our our thinking was, you know, it's very possible she has like a she has physiological well it's somewhat possible. She has physiologic anisocoria, she has a little bit of um, asymmetric ptosis um, due just to to um, you know inclusion and disinsertion of the right side more than left and you know, maybe her convergence insufficiency explains her exophoria, but more likely she's got a cranial third nerve palsy. So she did get an MRI, MRA, um, and on imaging, this was like a, a few days later, um, you can see on the right side that, let's see, well, I won't do that one yet, that she's got, this is more the neck of the aneurysm right there, the posterior communicating artery, and it measured like 11 millimeters in greatest diameter um, in total, and it was kind of like inferior, we displaced just on the right side, and so they did reconstructive imaging, it does look pretty sizable there, so it's coming off where the ICA meets the PCOM. Sorry, I'm not used to this. Right there. Um, so she was referred to neurosurgery. She had a pipeline embolization, coil embolization of the um, 
aneurysm, and she was discharged with aspirin and prostaglandin. We're going to be seeing her back in a week or two, because this, this only happened recently. Um, but it, it, that went pretty well. So the, the what I took out of this is that um, she had two millimeters of anisocoria, and that's not physiologic. If it's more than one, that merits a workup for any anything else that could be causing uh, uh, an anisocoria from a deficit from a deficiency reason. Um, and also an uh, exodeviation of any sort that's worse on contralateral gaze and potentially on um, improved on down gaze can be part of a cranial third nerve palsy without having a full-blown motility deficit, as you were talking about um, earlier. So, and, uh, um, and the reason that, I didn't put this in here, and the reason that we get the pupillary involvement in cranial third nerve palsies is um, because those pupillary fibers are fallen along the like, medial aspect of the outside of the cranial third nerve where it like runs up right against the posterior communicating artery. So just so, I know we look out for these aneurysms a lot and they're not always positive, but this was a case that was really interesting because it was a little more, um, took, took a little more, more piecing it together than some of the other ones. Any questions about that case? All right, well, I didn't remember any pupil cases that I've had in the past month, so um, for those of you who watched all of DR's video, shame on you, because we only said to watch the first four minutes, so this is just gonna be repeats. <laughs> but I think it's good that we go over this. Um, okay, so, and like I said, I don't know this man, so I'm gonna talk like I, examined him, but I didn't. Um, this is thanks to DR. Um, so he's a 34-year-old male. He was referred for a right-blown pupil. Um, so he, th this is uh, in, in a neuro-ophthalmology clinic, but apparently in the middle of the day of Saturday, his vision was a little blurry. He looked in the mirror and he had this very dilated right pupil. Um, and so here's a picture of uh, not him, but what I imagine it would look like except on the right side. So um, you can see the, the <laughs> left pupil is uh, significantly enlarged than the right pupil. Um, so he walked into the ED that Saturday. They got uh, an MRI head, neck, and MRI brain, which was all negative. Um, he was referred to neuro-ophthalmology non-urgently, but was really freaked out by the fact that you know, this could be an aneurysm, you know, people were telling him all sorts of things. And so he got in pretty quickly to neuro-op clinic. Um, as you can see, his exam was pretty unremarkable, vision was fine, his um, movements were full, visual field was full. His pupils, um, so, oh man, that looks really bad. You can't really see. Mm -hmm. um, well, okay, so who, who can see that <laughs> and wants to describe it to me? Oh, shoot. Um, Sarav, what do you see? Can you see the pupils or no? Is that unfair? Um, I think the right side is, lar is larger. Yes. Uh, yeah, what does RLF stand for? Uh huh. And why is it important that it's far? Not like accommodating. Yeah, exactly. Yep. I think it gets bigger at uh, D15 or uh, dim light after 15 seconds. Yep, yep, exactly. So with that, would you say then, so the difference in pupil size is in greater in light or dark? So the dark? The difference in pupil oh, sizes. I can't tell the difference. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's greater in um, light. So the, the, they, they become more equal in dim light. Um, and Sorry, DR actually had like little circles, which I should have done, but I didn't want to completely copy everything he had, so I thought I would just do this, but obviously that was the wrong choice. <laughs> I should have, but, but yeah, that's, so that's, I mean, I, I feel like that's really good to, to just, when you're going through your different, or your exam for anisocoria, it's really important to um, look at the pupils in light and dark, and basically the question you're asking is, where are the pupil sizes, the differences, the greatest? Is it in light and dark? Because that's gonna send you down two different pathways. 
which I have here, which is like a super simple diagram. So basically, in this gentleman's case, the difference was greater in light. So this is going to be a parasympathetic lesion. Um, and then if it's greater in dark, then that's going to be a sympathetic lesion. Okay. So this is a really cool table um, that I actually found off of a uh, anesthesia website. And it looks like really complex, but I think, you know, at least for me when I'm on call, I think I'm going to print this out and kind of put it in my pocket because once you, you know, you could go down the list and it bas basically gives you your differential. So when you actually give somebody a call and you're, you know, calling Dr. C in the middle of the night, you could have sound semi-intelligent kind of go down this. but. For this gentleman, so the unequal pupils are greater in bright, right? So then you kind of go through, is, are, are his um, uh, movements okay? Does he have any ptosis, papilledema? You know, go down the list. I don't need to go through this, but basically uh, you should print this out and put it in your pocket. So the differential diagnosis, um, what do we think the differential diagnosis for unequal pupils um, that is greater in light than dark. I see how some things out without looking at that. Pharmacologic, yep, exactly. What else? 80s, yep. And then what's like the scary, yeah, yeah, third nerve palsy, exactly. So, um, and I think eye trauma, of course, as well. So that's something that's really important to keep in mind. So this gentleman um, ended up having, uh, you know, I, I, if you guys actually listened to the lecture, uh, ginseng weed, which... It's not ginseng. This isn't it? It's, um, that is ginseng weed. That's J-I-M-S-O-N. Wait, this is not that. That's the, that's the that's flower, but it's, it's uh, um, yeah. what it's called is ginseng. Oh, okay. Well, you, you get what I'm getting at. It's the, plant, the picture of the plant is not that important. Okay. My point is the picture is right. It's a picture of a flower, okay? I just thought it was nice. But the point of this. Wow, you, it's the right flower. It's the correct flower, the, the drug name. Oh, the drug name. Oh, yeah, 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 there it is right there, Jimson. Yeah. Ginseng does not cause any pupil problems. Okay, thank you. <laughs> that was my point. All right, it's well. Have you drunk any ginseng tea recently? <laughs> so, Do you get ginseng tea? I think this is important to go, um, just remember that there are different drugs that can cause pharmacological nidriasis. And I mean, this is a busy list, but I think in terms of the most common that you will see maybe in the hospital is uh, diphenhydramine. You could have um, also, uh, you know, any sort of atropine, which is actually what, is cause, what causes the nidriasis in Jimson weed. Um, and so just something to keep in mind, I think that oftentimes when it is drug induced, we think it would be bilateral, but there are also a lot of like reports, case reports of um, unilateral medriasis. And so I thought it was a good case to go over just to keep in mind when you're on call or when you see somebody. So guys, in addition to that, it's a very good list, uh, but what's the um, drug that they use uh, all the time for Inhalation treatments. Oh, the nebulizers in the ICU. Yeah, I mean, in, in the hospital, that's going to be the big one. And these, they're, they can cause bilateral medriasis if you're taking systemically, but the point of the unilateral is usually it's topical. Yeah, in this case, um, I think I actually saw this patient. He had, uh, he was outside gardening, was gardening, and he took his gloves off, it was hot, and he kind of wiped his eye, and, and they didn't even ask him, like, any history of the ER, they just sent him straight for scans, so, <laughs> don't forget to ask history. You <laughs> <not> history. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, I have no plant pictures in my uh, presentation, so, <laughs> I'm just going to turn on the lights. Um, because we have some photos to look at here. Cool. We'll so we'll talk about Insecore. Uh, let's see. 
So this is a gentleman um, who was in clinic, a 69-year-old guy who was referred from an outside ophthalmologist for evaluation of unequal pupils and a droopy lid on the left. Um, he'd seen a general ophthalmologist for cataract evaluation, and there he noticed, uh, an ophthalmologist noted Anna Sikori, and his wife had noticed that his left eyelid had been droopy for years, but really hadn't paid attention to any unequal pupil sizes. Initially, he told us, you know, I don't have any headaches, I don't have any neck pain, I don't have any changes in vision. But then his wife reminded him, oh, you know, actually, you know, you have these episodes a few times a year where you get... Um, your lid gets really droopy and you have these bad headaches and your eye gets a little bit red, you get a little teary. Uh, but he didn't, he didn't really think it was important to bring that up. Uh, so it's important to have um, collateral when you're taking history. Um, his exam was otherwise pretty unremarkable. Acuity was normal, motility was full, visual fields were full, and then his pupils, we'll take a look at here. So this is, an exam, this is a picture of him. Um, and does anyone want to tell me what they, what they see in this picture? Uh, it's not a trick question. Um, anybody? Yeah, yeah, so there is an equal pupil size, the left is smaller than the right, and what do you notice about his lids? Higher lid crease on the left. Yeah, yeah so there's a bit of, of ptosis on the left, exactly, exactly. So, Brad kind of took us through... I'm not sure I can actually see the lid crease, per se. You can see the fold, but, you know, the crease is when you're actually looking at the lid itself, sort of open up, like if his eyes were closed, you'd be able to see the lid. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Okay. So there is ptosis on the left and a smaller pupil or myotic pupil on the left. And Brad kind of took us through, um, you know, the pathway to try to figure out what's going on. But, but what's the next question we should be asking ourselves is, you know, we see these differences in pupils, but is it greater in the light or the dark? And so thankfully we have these photos. And it's a little subtle, but um, you know, his ptosis did not resolve. I think opening his eyes there. but. Um, what you can see is that the, the difference, it's a little bit hard to say here, but for the sake of argument, the difference is a little bit greater uh, in the dark than the light. Um, um, and so the next question is, you know, the, the differential for things that are greater in the, in the light or the dark, Brad kind of went through that. Specifically for the differential for things in the dark, uh, we want to decide between, obviously, you know, we're, we're leaning towards, is this something like a Horner syndrome, or could this be something simple like physiologic anisocoria? And, what can help us differentiate, just on physical exam before we do any kind of, you know, drop test or anything else, what can help us differentiate between for a physiologic anisocoria and a Horner syndrome? Any ideas? There's a, a dilation lag, exactly, exactly. And so the way we look for that is here, we have his um, uh, pupils here at five seconds and then on the left at 15 seconds. And you can see it's a little subtle, and again, for the sake of argument, go with me here. But you can <laughs> say that uh, you can see that here at five seconds, um, compared to 15 seconds, the the, the anis is a little bit different, maybe half a millimeter to a millimeter, but it is different um, at five seconds compared to 15 seconds. So we would say this is a positive dilation lag. And so the next step would be um, to do um, pharmacologic testing. And so here, we can see, oh, well, uh, what do we notice here? This is um, uh, 30 minutes after giving aproclonidine. What do we notice here? This is a little bit higher on the left now, and it's reversal of anisocoria. Exactly, yeah. yeah, yeah. So this is, uh, you're exactly right. We see reversal of anisocoria. We see reversal of histosis. Um, and so this is um, diagnostic of a Horner syndrome. So um, Horner syndrome is something that we see uh, you know, fairly frequently, and it's an important thing to, to remember and talk about. So Horner syndrome is a uh, dysfunction of the sympathetic pathway um, uh, to the eye. So the classic triad we all learn in medical school is ptosis, meiosis, and anhydrosis. The ptosis is a re result of loss of innervation uh, to Mueller's muscle. Um, the meiosis is a result of unchecked action of the iris sphincter um, due to that loss of sympathetic innervation to the dilator. And then the anhydrosis, so the textbooks say that depending on where the, um, where the lesion happens, you can see different differences in the uh, anhydrosis. So if it's a first or second order lesion, you'll see anhydrosis of that entire side of the face, whereas if it's a third order or a postganglionic lesion, you'll see, le uh, you'll see anhydrosis just of the forehead. I don't know how often that's seen clinically, but that's what the textbooks say, and uh, that's what we'll remember for our OCAPs. So this is a, um, a diagram of the pathway. So the sympathetic pathway starts um, up here in the hypothalamus, you can see the first order neuron goes down, it synapses uh, in the stellate ganglion right there uh, in the thorax, and then uh, that goes up, it synapses again, um, and uh, the third order neuron then goes out to the face and to the eye. 
and you can have a lesion anywhere along this pathway that can result in a Horner syndrome. So the differential diagnosis for Horner syndrome is pretty long, um, and depending on where uh, the lesion is can help you, you know, there could be associated symptoms that will help you um, uh, decide where, where the problem is. A couple to be aware of here, um, so first order lesions, you can have this, um, you know, we learn about it in medical school for step one and everything, the, the classic Wallenberg syndrome, or the lateral medullary syndrome. Here you'll see, um, so on the face, you see this lateral impairment of pain and temperature sensation over the face with contralateral uh, pain and temperature sensation impairment over the, the trunk and limbs. You'll see uh, ipsilateral ataxia, and then you'll see this, you can see this ipsilateral corner syndrome. Um, the one that we always remember is this Pankos tumor. Um, so if you have, um, uh, an apical lung tumor, uh, that can certainly cause it. And then um, in third order, uh, uh, third order problems can certainly be um, listed right there. Um, credit artery dissection is one that we don't want to miss. Um, so pharmacologic testing, uh, just to walk through it, um, a review from the video that we had. So cocaine uh, is used, it blocks the uptake of norepinephrine. Um, and in a normal functioning eye, right, that doesn't have a Horner syndrome, it should result in dilation. Now, post-cocaine anisocoria of greater than one millimeter is diagnostic of a Horner syndrome because in a Horner's eye, there's no, um, there's no norepinephrine, you know, there's no sympathetic innervation there, so it's not going to dilate like a normal eye would. Um, the other drug we use frequently is apriclonidine, or iapidine is the other name for it. It's an alpha-2 agonist and a very weak alpha-1 agonist, and it will result in dilation of a Horner's pupil due to denervation hypersensitivity. So, um, Reversal of anisocoria, like we saw in our patient, is diagnostic of a Horner syndrome. But there's a couple limitations to using aproclonidine. One of them was in one of the questions at the beginning of the lecture. It takes time to develop denervation hypersensitivity. So in the acute setting, if someone comes in with a Horner syndrome um, and you give them aproclonidine, you may not see uh, the expected result if it's within the first couple days because it takes time to develop this hypersensitivity. And then aproclonidine really isn't to be used in children for the same reason that bromonidine isn't used in children. It can cause them to become apneic, uh, which is something we like to avoid in our pediatric population. Um, and then hydroxyamphetamine is another drug that can help us localize. This has been used historically, and um, I think the issue is with supply and getting this, we don't really use it that often anymore, but the idea is, is that it enhances the release of presynaptic norepinephrine. And so, depending on where the, where the lesion is, it can help you localize that. So, if you give hydroxyamphetamine and there is no dilation, then that tells you that the issue is on that third order neuron. However, if you have dilation after giving hydroxyamphetamine, that tells you the third order neuron is intact, and you've got a first or second order Horner's issue uh, going on. A couple special cases to be aware of. Horner is associated with pain, especially cervical pain is a carotid dissection until proven otherwise. This is something that we really wouldn't want to miss, and this patient would need imaging. Um, another case that, you know, may have been the case for our patient, he actually has been lost to follow up, he never really came back. But um, Horner's associated with um, headaches uh, is, is, a, is another known phenomenon as well. And, um, you know, autonomic cephalgias um, could certainly result in this. Um, there's a specific syndrome in, specifically seen in, in a man called Rader paradrigeminal uh, phenomenon, which, you know, uh, is a syndrome of headaches associated with Horner's. And actually, over time, if that, if that happens frequently, then the ptosis and can become more permanent. And then in pediatric patients, um, if you see a Horner syndrome, we always have to think about neuroblastoma. Now, Horner skin in a pediatric patient can be caused by trauma, so birth trauma specifically. So if there was a traumatic birth, if their brachial plexus was stretched, or if there was a traumatic delivery, that could certainly be a cause of Horner's. But if it was an atraumatic birth, um, and this patient has a new Horner syndrome, we have to think about a neuroblastoma of the sympathetic chain, and that patient probably um, deserves, deserves some imaging there. Um, so, that's a quick overview of Horner syndrome. Um, any questions about that? Okay, awesome. Can I add? Yeah. I don't know if this is going to be covered, but um, the other thing you want to think about is other things that, other than Horner's, that would cause a pupil that failed to dilate to cocaine and or hydroxyamphetamine. Sure. So traumatic pupils, um, things that cause synechia, can give you a false, uh, false right. negative result in that case. Yeah. So. That's why a good slit lamp exam can be really helpful. Yeah. So indeed, another case of anisocoria. Um, I also borrowed from DR um, just for completeness sake in the cases that we were presenting. So 
Um, I modified it a little bit, but we have a 35-year-old woman and she presents uh, to the emergency room because her friend noticed all of a sudden that her pupils were unequal. Um, she had some associated blurriness of the vision in her right eye and she has never had anything like this before. Um, actually, it's going to be her left eye based on my measurements from below. Her visual acuity was 20-20 in both eyes. Her um, left eye was noted to be larger than her right eye. Um, and Sorry, this is all switched up. I didn't realize this until last night. Um, so the affected pupil is going to be unresponsive to light with decreased accommodation. Um, her extraocular movements are full and painless. Um, visual fields are full to confrontation bilaterally. And then um, because you're a great neuro-ophthalmology student, you carry around your reflex hammer and note that the patient also has a reflexia of the knees and ankles bilaterally. So just to clarify, um, so let's say the affected side is larger and then it has, um, it's the affected side is unresponsive to light with decreased accommodation. So what are you guys thinking? So you have a large, I think an abnormal pupil is a large pupil that's unresponsive to light with decreased accommodation. And so then you go do a slit lamp exam. Um, and so there's a really great, I watched this video last night on the Moran Corps from Dr. Degree. Um, and so what do you guys see here other than the arrow sign? <laughs> What do you call that? Sexual. Sectoral palsy. So this video um, from Dr. Degree was really helpful because um, it there, talks about turning the slit lamp on and off and on and off and watching the pupil actually move and there's like some areas where it's slower um, and not as quick. And so it was, this was, the gentleman in the video actually has a bilateral 80s and it's really, it was really subtle and actually I, need to go, I want to go back and watch it again. Um, and then they watch him look at near and, his, and watch his pupil movement as well. Um, so, this, so then you find a sectoral palsy um, on exam. So this is an 80s tonic pupil. Um, so this is a benign idiopathic syndrome. It's thought to be due to damage uh, in the ciliary ganglion. And so there's, um, when histologic studies are shown to have reduced ganglion cells, um, and you lose this postganglionic parasympathetic innervation. So the causes can be um, pretty broad, but um, in addition to being idiopathic, so surgery, trauma, viral infection, or basal spasm due to migraine, and then, in addition, it can be um, associated with a more general neuropathy or pharmacologic blockade. So this is important. Um, so whenever you have a patient with this right, right or an enlarged pupil, you want to think about their past medical history. So for example, do they have really bad diabetes um, and like really terrible neuropathy? And then you want to examine their medications because, as Brad talked about, all of those things that can cause an enlarged pupil and the, med the anticholinergic medications could give you also a clue to the diagnosis. Um, and then basically the, the other associations um, think about really peripheral um, neuropathies, so chronic alcoholism, Charcot-Marie Tooth, um, sarcoidosis, things like that. Uh, it tends to be 70% women, usually in the middle ages, and it's unilateral and 80%, but this can be bilateral. Um, the second pupil is involved at a rate of 4% per year. And then if you have diminished deep tendon, tendon reflexes and orthostatic hypotension, then that's Holmes ED syndrome. Um, and generally, you don't need additional imaging. And so, a lot of the symptoms that they have will be in um, relation to accommodation, which can usually resolve within a few months, um, but can be difficult to treat. So, you can try um, pilocarpine multiple times a day to constrict the pupil, and then prescription reading glasses to correct impaired vision. And so, of course, the treatment um, is also how you can help diagnose it. So, um, and there's kind of a timeline of the findings, particularly with an AD pupil. So, on the first Day, you'll have this large pupil um, in the light and dark. It's unresponsive to light and near, and then you note the sectoral palsy on slit lip examination. And about a week later is when you develop the denervation sensitivity. Um, and so that time is when it's, you can start doing your pilocarpine testing. Um, and so then uh, months later, um, you can see the light near dissociation. So, and that's why basically the light near dissociation is that. As the pupil redilates after constriction very slowly, um, it's that's where the term the tonic comes from because of the slow redilation um, after pupillary constriction. And then years later, um, so Dr. has this in his video. Um, so this is a gentleman who, um, whenever they were first diagnosed, um, I can see that. Does anyone know which one's the abnormal pupil? Can you tell on the top which one looks bigger? Right. right. 
Yeah, and then years later, so you can tell that he's aged um, quite a bit, you notice that the right pupil is smaller, and it looks like he even has a little bit of ptosis as well on the right side, so this would look like a right-sided Horner syndrome years and years later. Um, but this could be um, a bloke that's also actually just him with a little old 80s pupil. It's kind of a timeline of findings there. Um, so an uh, unreactive pupil in a conscious patient um, also, also a large, a large unreactive pupil in a conscious patient. Um, your slit lamp exam is really important, and the sectoral palsies can be really subtle. Um, and then after a week, then you can treat um, or you can test with dilute pilocarpine. So basically, you put your dilute pilocarpine in both eyes. You wait an hour, and then the affected pupil should constrict more than the normal pupil. And then 80% uh, of these of patients will show col cholinergic denervation supersensitivity. It can be bilateral. Check your reflexes. Um, and then two points that DR had in his teaching points as well is that you can have supersensitivity to a cranial nerve 3 palsy and then he talks about also a midbrain choreoctopia, so where you can have oval pupils due to rostral midbrain disease um, or intrinsic compression. So, do you have anything else to add, Dr. Warner?